You don't look like the kind of guy would be on NBC, right? No. <laughs> what, 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 what looks strange about this? Uh, I guess you, mainly. Me to begin with, right? Yeah, I don't know. Thanks a lot. Coming from you, that's a real compliment. Oh, yeah, I, I know. And now I have a show on NBC. Can you believe that? Why? Did, why? Everything you see on tonight's show is true. It's informative. It's basically turning over an hour of TV to guys like us. Hey. Educational. If you had to choose between uh, a brainy Baywatch or a sexy McNeil Lair show, which would you choose? Sexy, definitely. And sexy. Uh, that seems to me an extraordinary statement. Do you believe that I have a show on TV? Uh, uh yes, I'm going to believe it right now. Yeah, because you have the camera and you have the microphone. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. TV Nation, we're on the air. TV Nation with Michael Moore. Tonight, Michael Moore asks what exactly can the chairman of American companies do? Louis Gerstner, CEO of the IBM Corporation, we challenge you to come down and format a computer desk. Do not be afraid. Karen Duffy finds out how some people are getting rich off people with AIDS. We're not standing here waiting for the person to die, but we just want to know when they've died so we can file the application. Louis Theroux meets the new Ku Klux Klan. This is one of our roadside sales signs, and it's kind of catchy for the discriminating individual. Is that because you discriminate? No, we do not discriminate. No, sir. It's not a, it's not a pun. Yeah. No, of A slight not. one. Well, maybe this time. Michael Moore enjoys the fruits of victory with a tour of free and democratic Kuwait. Do you want McDonald's? Yes. I like it. We'll see what we can do about that. Yeah. OK. You know, as the liberators, and the least we could do is give you McDonald's, right? Mel Marco meets the happiest animals in America. Pets on Prozac. Get it! Good boy. Good boy. <laughs> You know, I was watching TV the other night, and, and, and there was the chairman of Honda Motor over in Japan on the assembly line with his workers building a Honda with his own hands. <laughs> and I got to thinking, well, what can the chairman of our companies do? I mean, do they know how to build or operate the products that they sell? Or are they just a bunch of bean counters? So I decided that tonight, as a public service to our viewers, we're going to test their mettle and find out. Get ready, corporate America. It's the TV Nation CEO Challenge. Tonight, we ask the question on the minds of most underpaid Americans. Do the chairman of American corporations know how to build or use their own products? To find out, we issued our challenge to the chief executive officers of over two dozen major American corporations, including IBM, Ford, Philip Morris, and Colgate Palmolive. We wrote to them and asked them to show us on camera what they knew about their products. Should they meet this challenge, their prize will be this beautiful golden putter and executive putting green. Unfortunately, none of the CEOs responded to our letter, so I took our challenge directly to their corporate headquarters. Each contestant would have one hour to come down and display their executive prowess. Our first contestant, Louis Gerstner, chairman of IBM. Attention, attention, Louis Gerstner, CEO of the IBM Corporation. We challenge you to come down and format a computer desk. I don't think he's coming. Put down your putter and come down for the CEO challenge. We are IBM compatible. Apple and Macintosh are toys. IBM are real computers. He wouldn't see me. The hour was up. Chairman Gerstner would not take us up on the challenge. So we moved on to contestant number two, 
Ruben Mark, chairman of Colgate Palmolive. Attention, attention. Mr. Ruben Mark, chairman of the Colgate Palmolive Company. We challenge you to come down and put the toothpaste in the tube. We need to know, can you do what your workers do? You are paid more than them, and rightly so. Have you seen Mr. Ruben Mark? No. We will wait. Thank you. People of Colgate Palmolive. You all smell so good coming out of the building. I would like to smell you closer. Please come and do the dishes for me. While waiting for the chairman, his employees cheerfully offered to do our dishes with palm olive liquid soap. Mr. Mark, we have met your employees and they can do the dishes. He's gone for the day. After one hour, Chairman Mark was a no-show. So we moved on to contestant number three, Michael Miles, chairman of the Philip Morris Company. Michael Miles, chairman of the Philip Morris Company. We challenge you to come down and roll a cigarette. We have the ingredients. Mr. Miles, I know this sounds like a stupid question, but what exactly did Philip Morris die from? Who's in charge? I'm in charge. Your name? Michael Moore. Do not be afraid. I am unarmed. Please come down and explain the line. I'm a joker. I'm a smoker. I'm a midnight toker. Have you seen the chairman? Please do not shut the door on me. Have you seen the chairman of the company? Hello. If you see the chairman, would you please tell him to come down and roll a cigarette for me? Please. It's only one cigarette. Please. Shortly after declining the TV Nation CEO challenge, Chairman Miles resigned because he suddenly felt Philip Morris should be run by someone who knew and smoked tobacco. Indeed. Next, we were off to Dearborn, Michigan, and contestant number four, Alex Trotman, chairman of the Ford Motor Company. Mr. Alex Trotman, CEO of the Ford Motor Company. We challenge you to come down and change the oil in a Ford. Unlike the other CEOs, Chairman Trotman was up for the challenge. Mr. Trotman? Yeah. Yeah. Michael Morgan. Marshall. All right. Hey. See nice to see you. Yeah. Thanks for uh, coming down. Uh, uh, sounds like fun. Alex, when's the last time you touched the bottom of a Ford? Uh, last summer. I would recommend you, you go and have your oil changed by the dealer, by the way. Or they could have chairman change it. Or they could have me come over right. and change it. But I, a slightly expensive way to do it. It would be expensive, and we, uh, since we sell over 4 million vehicles a year, it would be tough for me to get around and do everybody's oil. I'd love to do it for our customers, but I just don't have the time. Right. So the Ford slogan is quality is job one. What is job two? Wow. Well, if quality is job one, what is job two? Well, we, don't, we don't have, we don't think of... What second, really? There you go. Head right, right in the, right in the cross. The so vehicle's now ready. For another set. set. Ready for another 5,000 miles. Alex Trotman, chairman of Ford Motor, you've met the TV Nation CEO challenge. You will receive the golden putter and putting green, compliments of TV Nation. And to the other CEOs of America. Attention, attention, men and women of corporate America, come down and accept the TV Nation challenge. And now we bring you the official TV Nation poll. 204 Americans were surveyed by the firm of Widgery & Associates, a professional polling firm. 
65% of American women believe there's a lot of difference between a campaign contribution and a bribe. Only 35% of men see a difference. All right, don't leave the room, don't leave the TV, because Mike here is going to Kuwait. Welcome back to TV Nation. Investment brokers all across the country have discovered a brand new way to make a killing. AIDS. If I told you that I could take your money and double it, but in the process somebody would have to die, nobody would be killed. I mean, they're going to die anyways. What would you say to that? Anybody I know? Nobody you know, a total stranger. He was going to die anyways. Probably. Maybe. I don't invest in the Reaper. Well, I want you to take a look at this little investment story we've done here for TV Nation. We sent our reporter, Karen Duffy, out to investigate how to make you some big bucks with no risk. Take a look. The best things in life are free. Just because the booming 80s are over doesn't mean there aren't any more high-prop investments. Investment brokers have discovered a huge new industry. They buy up the life insurance policies of people dying of AIDS and resell them to the public for a profit. To find out how this business works, I went to see Stan Sloven, a broker in New Jersey. So as an investor, say I give you like a $50,000 nut. For a $50,000 investment, you would get back a $25,000 profit. Sounds good, and it's easy to understand. For instance, if a person with AIDS has a life insurance policy worth $100,000, you can pay just $50,000 for it. And when he dies, you get the whole $100,000. So what would be a primary risk to the investor? There isn't. Mm -hmm. There is no downside. No downside. That's because once you buy a dying person's life insurance policy, you're always guaranteed to get your profit. It's just a question of when. We went to Waco, Texas to talk to the pioneer of this new business, Brian Pardo. So but by the look of your office, looks like you're real busy. How is business? This year? Well, business is booming. <laughs> and yeah, I, I am busy. How does your business work? Well, uh, first of all, we're given the files of coming from people who have submitted their policies to us to evaluate for an offer. These are all people who have AIDS and want to sell? Yeah. Oh, yes. All these are people who want to sell their policies wow. and who were buying their all policies. All over the country? Yes, from all over the country. Aren't you going to run out of people with AIDS? Even though there's about 350,000 people nationwide with full-blown AIDS, yeah. uh, or but maybe I'm a little sure. less, that's a revolving door. And the average life expectancy of a full-blown AIDS patient is 14.6 months. And there's a big reservoir of people out there, more than a million. I think our average age of our seller is about 34 years of age, which to me is a very tragic number in terms of their age. But on the business side of this, they really haven't paid in much. They've only paid in maybe 1,000 or 1,200 in premiums. So you can say, well, wow, you know, they only paid in $1,200 in premiums and they got $60,000, let's say, or something like that. That's a major gain. We have this huge network of buyers, mm -hmm. and so we're constantly transmitting information to our network. Uh, Jackie Davis back here is our controller. I guess it'd be a fair statement to say you've seen a few million dollars a week flow through here too, don't you? <laughs> mm -hmm. And then it would it be fair to say that you deal with millions of dollars a week? <laughs> would that be would that be very fair to say? Very fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Caught me. <laughs> so what are you really? doing now, Brian? Well, I'm signing for us. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I I sign whatever's put in front of me. I'm a pushover. So look at <laughs> I say I'll sign anything but a check. <laughs> the title work gets done. The trustee changes the title, and we've got a done deal. And all this is legal. Oh no yeah, problem. sure. Oh yeah. A Texas state representative spoke with us about buying the policies of dying AIDS patients. I have six policies, and uh, in the six policies, I have invested about $200,000. Mm -hmm. And you've done okay? Um, I, I've been in it about a year, had, had one policy come to fruition, and, the man and died. Uh, made about uh, 17 to 18% on that. This, this is a lot safer investment than, uh, for instance, the stock market, which is depends on some factors that we don't know what they are. But as an investor, a cure for AIDS must be your worst fear. Uh, there's no evidence of any cure on the horizon, and you know, that's always back in your mind that someday they may cure AIDS. Uh, but at this point, that's really not a risk factor. It's, it's not probable. Uh, I mean, it, it is absolutely 
that you're going to die once you get AIDS. The shorter that they, their prognosis is, of course, the more the policy's worth. Uh, and the longer that they live, the, the less the policy's worth. If, if the patient dies earlier than they say they could, you, you could earn up to as high as 30 percent. I went to New York where I met another broker, David Landy. How does the investor find out when the AIDS patient dies? One company that comes to mind has cards they give people and ask them, send in this card every month to tell us whether you've changed your address. So they get a card every month. If they don't get a card, then, then they know something happened. Really, the one thing we really need to know, we're not standing there waiting for the person to die, but we just want to know when they've died so we can file the application. You mailed everything to him on January 10th? Have you heard anything from him? Oh, my goodness. When the investors realize how much they're helping that individual and their families uh, with, get up, off from under the, or to help to alleviate the financial burden, that, is, that is, um, is what I think is probably one of the more important considerations. An important consideration, yes, but not as important as the investor's own profit margin. Either way, a life insurance policy intended for future generations is being used right now to cover society's cruel oversights. Down in Missouri, there's Bill Crust, an AIDS broker with a vision. I thought, I want to start a business. This is a great business to be in. And I'm, I'm just brainstorming. I, I went to my health club to work out. I run into a friend. I'm telling him what I'm going to do. And he had a funny look on his face. And he says, why don't you call yourselves Vultures Incorporated? And I, did, I sat right down. You know, I never thought of that. He's not seeing the whole picture. This is a total win-win situation for everybody. In fact, Karen and I had an out-of-body experience when, you know, when, when we got to the, to the point uh, that we had an unlimited amount of money. You know, that night I dreamed, and it was more than just a dream, that I died several years from now and went to heaven. And there were thousands of people. People with were, It was souls. There was no faces. You met me at the prison, you know, greeting me into heaven. And I really feel that's what will happen someday. I would say the next, next fastest growing segment of the market is cancer. And uh, now we're also seeing an awareness among uh, terminal heart patients. And uh, there will also be, and we've done some odd things like Lou Gehrig's disease and, and black lung and things that people on the average wouldn't think about, you know, but they're out there too. Mm -hmm. And uh, because people unfortunately die of a lot of things. We get 10% of face value. So if it's a million dollar policy, our fee is $100,000. Say, wow, wow. So how's business this year? Business is um, rather good, rather, rather good. I personally think I've, did a, I've done a lot better than I would have if I was stayed in CDs, you know. <laughs> but everything's relative. <laughs> you know, a lot of the critics just think it's kind of gorish that you would invest in this kind of thing. I, I think it's really, uh, it, it's really a, a, a humanitarian act to, to buy something that allows them to keep their home. It allows them to uh, keep their car. Uh, typically, they don't have a job at this point in their life. So how did you feel when the AIDS patient you bought the policy from died? Well, you're sad, but you have your money to console you with. The outcome's going to be the same whether they get the money or not. The outcome's always the same. Coming up next, TV Nation, the new Ku Klux Klan, the original Boys in the Hood. What do you think about that? It's crazy. Welcome back to TV Nation. We're standing here on the fabled Madison Avenue with our correspondent, Louis Theroux. Louis, this street is the home of America's PR geniuses and image makers. And who better for an image makeover, I was thinking, than the Ku Klux Klan? Huh? Amazing but true, they're doing an image makeover. They figure it worked for Michael Milken and uh, New Kids on the Block, so why not them? Check it out. The Ku Klux Klan. Everyone knows what that means. White guys in the South who rode around at night in robes and hoods lynching black people. Burn, burn, nigger, burn. Nigger, burn, nigger. In fact, the Klan is America's oldest and largest hate group. It dates back 125 years, and at one time it had more than 4 million members. But that's ancient history, right? Not really. Like many successful enterprises, the Klan is using the techniques of Madison Avenue to repackage its image for the 90s. The new Klan wears suits, not robes. 
They appear on TV and radio. They're even on the information superhighway. And they have a new message. They say they don't hate anyone. They're just trying to preserve their culture. New product or just new package? To find out, I went to Harrison, Arkansas to visit Ku Klux Klan Grand Wizard Thomas Robb. Hello there. Howdy. I'm looking for Thomas hey, Robb. Hey, how you doing? You're the Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Na National Director. National Director. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. National Director Robb took us up to his headquarters where Klan employees were hard at work signing on new members and mailing out merchandise. What would you say is the traditional negative image of the Klan? The image is that, that every Saturday night you put on your Klan robe, you go out and lynch, lynch a black person, you know, or, or burn down somebody's home, or I mean, this is the image of just a bunch of yahoos out night riding on the back of a little pickup truck. Do you hate being called a hate group? The white people are my family. Yeah. I love it, but it doesn't mean I hate anyone else. I mean, hating people is, is, is stupid. Right, right. It's just a question of loving some less than others. Uh, our organization is just as so much about advertising. Our rallies is advertised, and the media is advertising. The literature we put out is advertising. It's all in advertising. Rob's looking at all kinds of ways to get the clan name out. This is the store where you get a lot of your merchandising done. Yeah, well, we get some keychains and ballpoint pens, fly swaps, cups, so, uh, like a cheerleader. Uh, megaphones. Heart. Yeah. Will the skinhead in the crowd please <laughs> leave immediately? <laughs> How about a lighter? Could be handy for cross burnings. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, that's, not, that's not cool. You can't use a big lighter for a cross -burning. No? No, you have to use a torch or something. How come? Well, it looks, that looks kind of... Tacky? Yeah, yeah, I guess tacky would be the word. So it sounds as though you're treating the clan more as though it's a business that needs its name out there rather than sort of keeping everything secretive and hug and as it might have done in the past. <laughs> well, we're not trying to keep anything secret. We're, we're a political organization. We try to use every means possible. When it comes to advertising, Rob's youngest son, Jason, is a little more traditional. Advertising makes it happen. Yeah. What does that mean, do you think? Um, I'm not really sure. I think it's a neat... Um, poster. Who's that guy? That's, um, a guy that sent that from... No, on the poster. Um, Porsche, the guy who invented the Porsche. Yeah. And the bug. That's him in the left. And in the middle? That's Hitler, of course. You a fan of his? Um, uh, not really. You know. It's a more or less a Porsche ad. So I guess the idea is if you get a, a big enough celebrity to endorse your product, um, you know, you could sell anything. Yeah. I guess uh, you could say that. Rob's also taking the clan into the information age. New leadership, new ideas, new direction, new future. We're not in a cow pasture anymore. We're not going to be stagnated in, in, uh, in the 1840s or 1860s, but we're going to progress into uh, the new decade and the new century. In bringing the clan into the 90s, Rob depends on state leaders like Michael Lowe in Texas. You're the Grand Dragon of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Yes, sir. How is your uh, clan group different from other clan groups? Well, one, we prom promotionalize. We have items to sell to the public, and that's an advantage. It's the 90s, and you need to sell yourself to the public and let them know the claim. I've been asked by the media, will you change your image to be acceptable? Of course we have. The Democrats will do it. Republicans will do it. Companies, big companies like Sears and these other groups. It has to work, because these are big businesses, and it works for them, it will work for us. We are having 36 rallies coming up. And this is one of our roadside sales signs, and it's kind of catchy for the discriminating individual. Yeah. Explain that one. That, why is that one in red? In red, it would stand out, because, you know, it has been weathered. But this way, they'll see it, that we have clan items sell for the discriminating individual. Yeah. The shop is catchy. Yeah. But that doesn't, does, is that because you discriminate? No, we do not discriminate. No, sir. It's not a, it's not a pun there. No, of course not. A slight not. one. Oh, maybe just like A little one. one. That is one of our t-shirts design. What's that all about? It's just a design that I picked up, and I'm going to make it to a t-shirt. It's kind of, does it have any uh, significance, these sort of stripes? No, no, it sure don't. It was just like that. And, and the sort of look of surprise and the... Yeah. Just sort of... Just a joke, yes, sir. Yeah. This is a joke. Happy birthday. Yeah. Kind of like a surprise. Could, could you explain it? Okay. One of these clans were having a birthday, so they rented a cake, and a black lady jumped out. Kind of like... It's a pretty good seller. This is one of the clan figurines that we sell. Hand-painted. Hand-painted, and they will take orders. Premium 
clan craftsmanship. Yes, sir. And it's craftsmanship with a capital K. With a K. Now, why is he sticking his arm in the air like that? It is a salute. You know, a lot of times the media will, they'll think that it's a Nazi salute. Okay. But not... It does. It looks a little bit like a Nazi salute. Yes, but it is a right-hand salute. Like the Roman Empire, they gave the right-hand salute to legions. But that's his left hand. They made it wrong. <laughs> While Michael was happy to show us some of the stuff in his bedroom, he did draw the line somewhere. How about this one? Now, now. Don't, don't burn me now. Put that picture um, down. He didn't want but us to show some racist stickers and a photo of his girlfriend, okay. who's yeah, a public school right. teacher. No. Uh -oh. Okay, you know, okay, yeah, let's you, go out and see. I mean, let's face it, I'm being nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Shaken but undaunted, I returned to Harrison to visit Rob's oldest son, Nathan, and his wife, Anna. Nathan, you're the son of the national director. What do you do in the clan? Uh, I speak at rallies some. I MC, help set up, uh, um, help set up rallies with my father. Yeah. I, uh, I'm a unit uh, den leader here in Harrison. Anna, what's your position in the clan? Well, I work at the national office some, and I'm his wife, so <laughs> I just support him and support the family and the clan. That was at Anna's first clan rally. Oh, which one? Uh, this one. These. These. Awesome. Yeah. Looks like these uh, headdresses weren't really made for kissing. No. <laughs> Did you try doing it with the, the hood down, first of all? Yeah, it's, and, you know, you should never chew tobacco in a robe or smoke. It's, it's hard with the mask on. What were those masks for, originally? I would have thought, I thought they were put to conceal people's identity if, you know, if they were, say, perpetrating crimes, you know, mm -hmm. maybe lynching people, tarring and feathering. I guess that that was uh, what they've said. You know, I guess it could be. Yeah. Do you ever get up in the morning and just think, I would love to lynch someone right now? No. Mm -hmm. I really don't. The clan is really not even about that. It's about, you know, being proud of yourself, not anything negative toward any yeah. other races. Yeah. The clan's biggest PR coup so far was getting the state of Arkansas to install an adopt a highway sign on Highway 65. Now that's community outreach. But how are local business leaders responding? I'm not going to talk about the clan. <laughs> well, how about just people on the street? So you think they're the same old clan? Sure. Why not? You're yeah. not a big clan supporter? Uh, nope. You know, I was never a big Nazi supporter either. And, you know, the neo-Nazis, the new Nazis are just as good as the old ones. Yeah. You know, just a new name. So you got a PR agent. So what? Well, looks like the verdict's in. The new repackaged clan's not a whole lot different than the old clan. They're just a lot more careful about what they say in public. But are they always so careful? Yeah, I love blacks. I don't hate blacks. When Negroes were slaves, at least they worked for a living. Now they lay around, and they're still living off of white people. Does it have anything in common with the Nazis? Not one thing, no, no sir. Thing. Not one thing. It turns my stomach when I see it. Our country, and we are claiming it back in the golden triangle for white America. We want to convey a message people can understand. We don't hate, we don't hate minorities. America belongs to the children of the Republic. Yeah. Not those that come from Mexico. Not those that come over here in slave ships from Africa. I don't go down the street looking at people and say, oh, he's a Jew, he's not a Jew, that one's a Jew, that one's not a Jew, and that one's, you know, that's not what I'm about. Do you love Jewish Americans? Wait a minute, let me ask you a question. You're a Jew, I'm going to talk to you. Yeah, careful. I want to repeat myself, All I will right. not talk to him. Oh, he... We're not interested in being the largest club in the country. We're interested in being a political power in the country. That's our goal. Still to come tonight on TV Nation. Holly wants her Prozac. And Fido wants some too. Meryl Marco meets America's Pets on Prozac. So the Gulf War, what was it about? Uh, it was about oil. Oil. The Bush family. The Bush family. Uh -huh. uh, you remember the Bush family? Uh, no, I'm not. You probably didn't get any oil then. Uh, no, I didn't. Free the slaves. Civil War. Stop the Nazis. World War II. Return the oil to a feudal monarchy. You know, I haven't heard much lately about the democratic reforms in Kuwait. You don't think they were putting one over on us, do you? You never, never know. know. You never, never know. know. I decided to go over to Kuwait and find out what exactly it is that we won in the Gulf War. Take a look. 
Hey, remember the good old days? The Cold War was over, but there were still some bad guys left to fight. Kuwait is liberated. My vision is of a world united and grounded in our democratic values. That is why Al Gore and I supported the decision to use force to get Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. Two of our leaders said it was our duty to free Kuwait and restore democracy. Three years later, I'm wondering how the freedom and democracy Kuwait is doing. So I decided to go over there and visit free Kuwait. My first stop on the freedom tour was the Kuwaiti parliament, the seat of their democracy. My guide was a member of parliament. Let's say we wanted to take a freedom tour of Kuwait. What would be the best spots to go to to see the freedoms here in Kuwait? Well, you, you got the press. The press? The most free press in this region. They can say anything they want you can about say anybody. Anybody, but you take responsibility if you, do, if you say something wrong. Now, what happens if you say something wrong? You will be taken to court. What's the worst thing that could happen if the court you says could, you were wrong? You, you could be taken to jail. Well, that's, uh, a, that's a fairly free press. The next stop was parliament. the parliament chamber mm -hmm. itself. I was told only first-class citizens could vote or hold office in Kuwait. To become a first-class citizen, you have to be an adult male whose family was living in Kuwait before 1920. That covers about 15% of the population. The country is actually run by the al Sabah family, the ruling sheikhs who own most of the country. So this is the emir's room? Yeah. Office. His office. And what is the book on the desk? Report, visitors, report, visitors. You know. Can we see who's been here? Well, look at this. Appreciative kind yeah. of guy. Appreciation for His Highness, the Emir, God bless, free, free underlined three times. Yep. Kuwait. Kuwait. Thank you, George Bush. <laughs> Mr. George Bush. Mr. George Bush. Kuwait is once more in the hands of Kuwaitis in control of their own destiny. Now, women can't vote here yet. No, right? not yet. We no? are a conservative uh, society. Mm -hmm. But do you think women will be able to vote someday? Yes, I think. Sooner or later, you'll, you'll be able to vote. Hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. One of these days. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about that? Good idea? Yes, he Good idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. just yeah. saying it. She could have About voting, he said no. 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 Elections, no. Oh, he doesn't, like, he doesn't want women to vote? No. No? No. That guy back there, now that we've lost him, let me tell you, all you got to do, a few demonstrations, you got to organize. We have, a, we have a thing in America called the National Organization of Women. Mm. You're familiar with it? I've heard of it. You've heard of it? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. so we'll start a branch here. You want me to start the uh, demonstration? Huh? <laughs> I will come to the demonstration, yes. <laughs> Don't tell these guys that. Okay. Our commitment to them must be equal to their commitment to their country. All the members of the royal family escaped the first day of the Iraqi invasion. Uh, all but one, uh, one of the princes who got lost, I guess he was out partying or something and uh, couldn't find his way back to the palace. And of course, he happened upon the Iraqi troops and they spotted him and, and killed him. And so the Kuwaitis decided after liberation to build a monument in his honor and, and they decided to bronze the car that he was killed in. And so we have this Lincoln Town Car here as Kuwait's war memorial. That apparently is his fist coming through the roof. Next, I was granted a private audience with one of the top members of the royal family, the Minister of Information. Is there any way that you'd like to show your appreciation to me personally as an American, just as a, you know, a guy who... I just, I just got to say thanks for coming by. Just thanks? After the war, the first thing the Al Sabah family had rebuilt was their own set of palaces and the oil fields. We must lead the world away from the dark chaos of dictators toward the brighter promise of a better day.
Did you use the jet skis during the war to liberate Kuwait? Yeah. Must be some foreign workers. Look happy. 70% of the people who live in Kuwait are foreign workers. They can't vote, own property, or use any of the free services Kuwaitis have. But they're really handy around the house, the yard, and the office. There are things worth fighting for. Perhaps there was no better example of the restoration of Kuwait than the rebuilding of Arab world. Saddam had stolen most of the rides and shipped them back to Baghdad. So we have, uh, you know, Alibaba restaurant. Oh, the Alibaba? Yes. You get Arab food in the Alibaba? Yeah. What's your favorite dish in the Alibaba restaurant? You've never eaten there, have no, you? No, no. You only go to pizza. I, I, I like pizza, you know. Yeah. Fast food. Yeah. That's better. I think it's better. Yeah. It's healthier, too. Yeah. <laughs> You don't have McDonald's here? Why not? I don't know. Do you want McDonald's? Yes. We'll see what we can do about that. Okay. You know, as the liberators, I mean, the least we could do is give you a McDonald's. Okay? You think the Kuwaiti people, do they like Bush more or Colonel Sanders? Any person of the people here, he must like Bush. Some of the Kuwaiti people called their children, their babies, with Bush. Bush? Yes. I mean, I mean Kuwaitis who have had babies have named them yes, Bush? they like Bush, Bush very much. Bush babies? Yeah. <laughs> Don't you think that in a, in a free country like the United States yes. and Kuwait, yes. having an amusement park like this strengthens the democracy? Yeah. Yeah. We did what was right. We free the people. Now the world looks more like America. My vision is of a world that narrows the gap between rich and poor. A world increasingly engaged in democracy. Well, that's a nice concept. And maybe someday Kuwait will be a true democracy. But for now, I guess we'll just enjoy our fruits of victory. Seventy percent of American women have never had emotionally satisfying relationship with a Republican. Coming up next on TV Nation, Pets on Prozac. I traveled around this great land of ours meeting animals who are actually taking Prozac. Really? And oddly enough, I brought television cameras with me so we can view the tape now. Would you like to do that? Yeah. Would you like great. that? Would yeah. you like to see pets, the animals pets I brought? On, pets on pets Prozac. Pets on Prozac. Wow. Just for you. <laughs> oh, what a good... This is Willie, a dog who loves his log. Some people think that's precisely his problem. <laughs> you feel he's fixated on the log. He's very much fixated on the log. He is not looking or enjoying anything else but this. Can you not play with him or... or... No. Pet him or something? No, you oh. can pet him. You cannot take his log away. <laughs> and this is how he lives life. The dog looked pretty happy to me, but I guess looking happy doesn't necessarily mean you're sane. I kind of take this very seriously. I see that this is not an easy way to live. If you take another dog out into the woods, they would get into the trees and walk and have a good time. Mm -hmm. Willie has to look at his log, stay with his log, and it, he doesn't see the big picture. To expand Willie's horizons, his doctor put him on Prozac, the miracle drug of the 90s. Ten million humans have tried Prozac and its lookalikes to treat their depression and other psychic disorders. Now, a handful of vets are prescribing Prozac to animals. Uh-oh. Get your log, Wills. Get it. Good boy. Good boy. 
he was wandering the streets of Long Island, and they picked him up. Right. And then I got him, and soon after, he got onto a piece of lawn furniture, and he just pulled the wood off of it. I called my neighbor up, and I said, get some wood over here. I need it before he destroys something else. If you saw a human going through life like this, he would be in a, he would be in a hospital. He'd be getting shock therapy. I'll tell you a little secret. It's odd that, I was, that he came into my life. I have obsessive-compulsive disorder myself. Do you really? Yes. Do you wash your hands? What do you... No, I've kind of worked through all that, and on a scale to 1 to 10, I was a 2. This is more serious. I mean, on a scale to 1 to 10, this is a 10. No one can be sure if Prozac will work for Willie, but we'll check back later to see if he's put down his log. This is Tufts University in Massachusetts, where Willie's doctor works. How many different dogs and cats have you prescribed Prozac to? I would think uh, a few hundred. How many animals nationwide do you think are on Prozac? Uh, increasing exponentially, I would say. Dr. Nicholas Dodman is experimenting with using Prozac and not just on dogs. It all seems to be about a natural brain chemical called serotonin. I mean, if you have very low serotonin, you can end up with these people in uh, McDonald's who machine gun to nine people with an Uzi. Yeah. And people who have the ultimate self-directed aggression suicide have very low brain serotonin. A drug like Prozac and Prozac lookalikes is, in, is giving a person more serotonin. Right. Dr. Dodman showed us a tape of some of the ailments he's trying to treat. This is a fly-catching dog, but there's no flies around. That's the difference. And you can hear it snapping in the air. <coughs> he's an elderly Great Dane, and he puts his head behind the curtains, just hangs out. And, you know, <laughs> it looks kind of amusing to see him, uh, you know, looking like a, a sheik. Uh -huh. Some people call it flank-biting. Some, some people call it self-directed aggression. We, we call it self-mutilating syndrome. They start spinning in circles, barking, yapping, chasing their tails. Some of them bite their tails off, you know, Ooh. like the tip of the tail off. I'm just maniacal. These guys are really sick. So Prozac helps with this? Mm -hmm. And then there's Ruby, the African gray parrot who keeps plucking out all her feathers. And we just woke up one morning and that was it. The feathers were gone. She became so obsessed with preening and she started to bleed. And we saw uh, Dr. Rosenthal and, and um, she thought it might be useful to... Uh, for Ruby to take Prozac. This is Ruby's Prozac, and that's prescription. Mm -hmm. This I is the instructions they gave you when you got the Prozac. When Avoid says. alcohol products. Well, she doesn't drink. Not at all. And use caution when driving or operating machinery. Where does that leave her with flying? Isn't it she, in a sense, actually operating a vehicle by flying? Why don't we give her the Prozac? Want no. your Prozac, Ruby? <laughs> she seems more silly, and she seems uh, more relaxed in general. Maybe too relaxed. Ruby. Two months later, we revisited Willie to see if the Prozac was helping him yet. Yes, he's a breakable. This looks like pretty good boy. He wouldn't really say hello before. No, he won't. Whoa, he won't. now he won't stop. <laughs> so he has a greeting disorder. Right. <laughs> now this is Willie after two months of uh, medication. Yep. You can't ask for better behavior in a dog than this, can you? What would He's you hope for? Good. He's looking good. He, he learned how to sit and stay, as you can see. No, this looks very normal to me. Yep, he didn't do this the last time. Before, if I did this, he'd want to grab it. And now I see no yeah. interest in this at all, which is great. Yeah. You know what he likes? He's a good boy. He's rear end scratched. He <laughs> loves that. Ooh. Ooh. He didn't seem to be obsessive compulsive anymore. But could he resist the temptation of a frisbee? What about a tennis ball? Wow, he wasn't fixated at all. I'm impressed. <laughs> Perhaps he really was cured. There was only one way to be sure. Anything here you think of interest to Willie? I think that log's in there. Willie. Willie. What do you think? Look at that. Look at that. Now that's amazing. Did you ever used to offer him a ball when he had the log before? Mm-hmm. But he would never put the log down, he wanted period. the log. And if a log wasn't around, he'd be swinging from that branch, trying to get a branch in his mouth. Right, so he had a, he was just, he was wood obsessed. <laughs> his name should be Woody. <laughs> yeah. well, then he would be obsessed with children. <laughs> Woo, yum, 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 yum. Mm. Mm. good log. Hey, can I interest you in a nice log? Which one, Willie? You want the log? He wants that. Well, ball. there you go. This is Willie to me. Can't let go of this. Yeah, I think you should maybe frame it. I think so. With his picture, nothing will work like this drug. That's for sure. To help an animal. Oh, it bring tears to my eyes to think that, you know, you can help an animal.
Well, that's our show for tonight. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you'll tune in again next week at this time for more of TV Nation. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have one more corporate chairman to challenge my own. Mr. Jack Welch, chairman of General Electric, we challenge you to come down and screw in a light bulb. We know you can do it. You are a smart and generous man. <laughs>
Each contestant would have one hour to come down and display their executive prowess. Our first contestant, Louis Gerstner, chairman of IBM. Attention, attention, Louis Gerstner, CEO of the IBM Corporation. We challenge you to come down and format a computer desk. I don't think he's coming. Put down your putter and come down for the CEO challenge. We are IBM compatible. Apple and Macintosh are toys. IBM are real computers. 